talk a little bit of Python, shall we? So we're going to be talking about processing strings today. So processing strings is something that you do forever and ever in any programming language that you uh, encounter. So let's talk about it. Let's make sure that you're comfortable with exactly how you go about doing that in Python. So one of the main usage of loops, our old friend Mr. Loop, is to process strings. Here's a string. Go stepping through that string and do something with it. Search it, replace it, find it, do something. Okay? Count the occurrences of one or more characters, verify that the contents of the string meet some sort of criteria, fantastic, wonderful. We do all sorts of wonderful things with strings. The question is, you got to understand the algorithms that we use to pull that off. All right, four string processing methods. Um, so these are actually Python commands I share with you, help you. So here's one. Whatever your variable is, dot is upper. So this is a check or a condition. It returns a true or a false. Okay? So if I pass this uh, input, it'll check to see if the current character is in uppercase. And what you get back is a true or a false. Okay? Uh, variable is lower. Test to see if the current character is in lowercase. Returns true or false. Variable dot upper converts the current character to uppercase. And variable is lower converts it to lowercase. Which is an interesting point, right? Because if, for example, in homework number two, you were tasked with the challenge of making sure that they put in what? A correct gender. Well, what, could, what possible gender, what possible valid values could be entered for gender? Come in. There's four of them, right? Male and female, granted, but there's four possible valid ones, right? Lower. Lower and upper, right? So if you were checking to make sure they entered the right thing, how many checks did you have to make? Ideally. Probably four, right? Well, you know, if you use this, you wouldn't have to, right? I'd only have to check two, right? So if I forced it to be upper, and then I checked to see if it was a capital M or a capital F, I know I was fine, right? If I don't do that, then in a perfect world, I have to check upper look and I have to check low. So they, uh, you don't use them every day by any stretch of imagination, but they are sort of handy, right? If I was checking um, eighth grade uh, writing assignments, and I wanted to make sure that at the beginning of every sentence they started with a capital letter, this is exactly something I could do. Counting matches. OK, well, this is cool. So we often want to count the number of values that need a given condition. Okay? For example, count the number of uppercase characters in the string. So uppercase equals zero. This is where we're going to store the number of uppercase characters we want. For our variable char, C-H-A-R, in string. String is apparently whatever contains our magic text. If char is upper, we just talked about that, so that's a true. This is where we're getting an if. Then uppercase equals uppercase plus one. Cool. That's all there's to it. Question? Is char a variable name? Yeah, it is. Is that a data type? It's actually, in this case, it is a variable name. Okay. A lot of other languages seem included. It would actually be a, a variable type. Yeah. So we get in trouble if we use it, right? Uh -huh. Yeah. Now they're playing games here because they knew they could get away with it. Poor choice on their part. Uh, sometimes you need to count the number of occurrences of multiple characters in the string. So if we have, for example, vowels equals zero for char in word, if char dot lower in, and then we have a range of letters, a e i o u. So if we find it in there, yay, we found a vowel, and we'll go ahead and we increment the number of vowels. Using dot lower allows us to limit the number of characters that have to be specified. So remember, we're checking for vowels, but we're just checking for lowercase vowels. Otherwise, we don't still have to check for uppercase vowels. But I think I got some code here. It's actually sort of cool code. I think you like this. So I got bored when I was putting this together. I said, well, I have to go searching for stuff in text. I should have at least some interesting text. Try this one on for size. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union. What's that from? Constitution. constitution. It's the whole damn constitution. I put the whole constitution here. You know how long this took to type in? Copy. I might have, but you don't have that word. I could have copied this. I could have copied this. You don't know about everybody? But I'll tell you what, I did discover one interesting thing, and this is trivia. This is Python trivia. It really has no actual lasting value. But so as you can well imagine, there are many lines of text in the US Constitution. So I dropped it in here, I put a quote at the beginning, I put a quote at the end, and 
Python quickly came back to me and said, um, incorrect EOL, end of line. I'm like, what? It turns out when you put a string in quotes for Python, that string cannot extend over the over one line. I thought, well, how the hell am I going to do this? It turns out the answer actually is triple quotes. So in Python, if you put triple quotes, you can have line after line of text. Just make sure you put triple quotes at the tail end. Python trivia. <laughs> Alright, so that's actually totally found. You go look at signatures New York, Alabama, Hamilton, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Ben Franklin, all those Anyway, so um, count the number of uppercase characters in the U.S. Constitution. Why not? Who else has done that before? Uppercase is zero or char in Constitution. If char is upper, uppercase equals uppercase plus one. Print, there are uppercase, uppercase characters in the U.S. Constitution. Cool. Let's take a look at the uh, U.S. Constitution and see how many uppercase characters they decide to put in there. And the answer is? 1,466 uppercase characters in the uh, U.S. Constitution. Which, I'd like to point out, makes for one fine midterm exam question. <laughs> no, not really. It does sound, seem sort of cool, doesn't it? Alright. If you liked that one, then you especially like this one. So how about we count the number of vowels used in the US Constitution? Vowels equal zero if or char in constitution. If char dot lower in A E I O U, vowels equals vowel plus one. Just like we had on the slides, let's give it a shot to it print out speed. Would anybody like to guess? No. Well, <laughs> that was a very constant uh, test. More than the number of vowels. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, at least like four times. 8,262, which was one off from what I would have guessed, but that's what I would have read. Um, so, yeah. so there we go. Already, this is not just a Python programming class, but this is actually a little bit of American history stuff. You will be so cool at the next cocktail party you go to and they say, hey, I wonder how many vowels there are in the US Constitution. Uh, worst party in the world. I'll find you on matches. Okay, sometimes you, you have a string, you want to find if something's in the string, right? You want to find the position of each match within the string. You cannot use the for statement, uh, the iterator of all characters, because you need to know the position of the matches. Instead, it's uh, always good to use within the range and look up character in each position. So sentence equals input, enter a sentence. So the quick round fox ran over the lazy dog. Or I in range of length of sentence, which will go from zero up to length of sentence minus one. If sentence is upper, print I. So what we're doing here is we're finding all the capital letters in whatever the user type did. Okay, that's so cool. Let's take a look at some code and see what we do on that. Let's go back and take a look at our U.S. Constitution one more time. Find the number of times the is used in the U.S. Constitution. Okay. So the count equals zero for I in range length of Constitution minus two. Why do I put minus two there? I want to look at the entire Constitution except I want to back off two from the tail end. Why? How long is the word the? Three letters. Three letters. So if I'm looking at this one, I'll look at the next what? Two letters. Next two letters. So I have to back off two because when I get the third to last letter in the Constitution, I'll be checking the next two to see if the, and then I should stop, right? Otherwise I'll run off the edge. Okay. If Constitution I dot upper plus Constitution I plus one upper plus Constitution I plus two upper, Equals. Does that account for spaces? Excuse me? The looking at the next two characters. Does it include spaces or if the word ends with T? 
my next one starts with HE. I don't really care, right? So I'm really looking at three characters. They can be spaces, they can be dots, they can be exclamation marks. Don't really give a dang. The one thing I don't want to do is run over the end. So in other words, I don't want to hit the end of the Constitution and then check two additional spaces beyond that. Because Python will blow up at that point. I'm saying, wait, you've exceeded the end of your string, right? Does that make sense? What's actually stored there? Maybe it's a hit, maybe it's not. Don't really care. It'll just be two spots. So you're going two back because the thumb is three. I'm going two forward. forward. Two forward. So I'm adding a particular location, and I'm checking the next two forward. Two forward. Next two forward. You bring up a good point. And actually, to, to his point, one thing I could have done was, at a particular point, I could have gone two back. And then I wouldn't have had to worry about exceeding the end, right? Mm -hmm. But the very first time that I started it, I couldn't have started at zero. What location would I have had to start my search at? Probably two. Because it would have been two, one, zero. It would have been the first spot in the string that I could put the. Because the is three one. Okay. Uh, if it equals the, then print i. So in other words, print the location that I'm at and increment my count. And then say, hey, this is how many times it happened. So how many times do you think there's the in the constitution? Oh. Twelve. We got twelve. Everybody going to go higher or lower? Give or take. Five thousand does? Hey, you read the constitution? No, I got bored after the first one. Four thousand. Oh, what's happening? The occurs 532 times in the U.S. Well, Constitution. That. that was the line. That was actually the location in the Constitution that I discovered the. Oh. Okay, that's <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I thought we were going to come back that. I was going to talk about that. I was like, huh? <laughs> that was that one, dude. I know that's what I was going to Finding the first match. Okay, so this is, um, I have a string, uh, I have something that may occur multiple times in it. Well, that's cool, kind of problems with that. I'd like to find the first time that it occurs. Okay? Well, what that basically means is you probably use a while loop. What you want to do is when you find it, you want to set some sort of condition that says, I found it, and then you want to stop your while loop. So I want to save the position that I found it at, but I want to have some sort of condition such as found, and once I find it, I said found it, yep, got it, and then all of a sudden the while loop stops. And I go ahead and drop out and print something that says, hey, I found it. I think we have code that does that. So once again, what we're actually doing is we're using our looping ability here. Back to the US Constitution, what do we want to do with it? We want to find the first occurrence of we. Please? How does the US Constitution go? <laughs> So where do you think we're going to find the first we? Right off the bat, right? All right, let's give it a shot. Let's see where it goes. We was found starting at location what? Is that what we pretty much expected? Black and all.
got to find it. We did. We have here on to subscribe our name, and then they signed it. So there's a we at the beginning and a we at the end, and then there's like a constitution in between. Woo! Pretty cool, huh? On your last match, and we just did that, validating a string. If you have to validate a string, for example, social security number, or actually a telephone number. A telephone number in the US, if you look for it, you probably have a parentheses and have the area code of those three digits, parentheses, another three digits, a dash, and then four, four digits. So we can examine strings, make sure that it actually works out that way. A little bit of code to do that. Valid is true, position is zero, while valid and position is less than the length of the phone number. If position as zero and the string position is a is not equal to a left parenthesis, then all of a sudden it became an invalid phone number. At position four, we would expect to see the other parentheses because we're around the area code. We go on to position eight, we're looking for a dash. We're going to be between the three digits and the four digits. And if we bump all the way down to the bottom here, um, if we bump into anything that's not a digit, like a letter or an exclamation mark or something like that, pass it be false. Otherwise, congratulations, move on to the next one. Tail end, we say, hey, look, it's a valid phone number or it's not a valid phone number. So stepping through a phone number, double checking what's at each location, tells us whether or not we got it correctly. Uh, one thing we can do is to build a new string. In this particular example, we have a credit card number that has dashes in it. And we're like, whoa, well, we'd like to have a credit card number without the dashes. And one of the things you cannot do in Python is you can't go into a string and get rid of stuff. Like if I have a credit card number, it's my variable, and it's got dashes in it. I can't go in and get rid of those dashes. Python doesn't let you do that. But Python will let me build a brand new string. Okay, that's cool. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter a credit card number. Here's credit card number is equal to nothing. Cool. And uh, user input is where I'm storing my credit card number. Or char in user input. So I'm going to step through with the person enter. If the character is equal to a space, uh, or a character is equal to a dash, Oh, I'm sorry, not equal to space or not equal to a dash, and go ahead and grab the digit out. If I run this, what's going to happen is this credit card number that had dashes in it is going to re be reproduced as just a solid number of dashes in it. Because I found the dashes and I did not copy them over to the new version of the credit card number that I put in. Okay, what do we count today? Uh, we went over counting matches, finding all matches, finding the first or last match, validating strength, and building a new strength. Anything spectacular in there? No. But it means if you ever bump into a string, you should feel comfortable that you can actually do anything you really want with that string. Strings can be manipulated. And in all honesty, a ton of computer code is used to do exactly that same thing. You guys have flipped a social security number around in homework number one, and in homework number two, you went ahead and encoded the social security number. So you're already doing a lot of stuff with strings in the code that you produce. Who knows? What you'd be called upon to do. No one's three and four. I don't know that I'm ready yet. Alright, what we're going to do next time, we're going to do something called problem solving, flow charting, and test cases. We'll also be talking about something we've actually been using, I probably should talk about it earlier, but Boolean variables and operators. Boolean is what? True false. True false, that's it. That's all there is to it, right? Okay, and you can convert it, and you can flip it around, and you can do all sorts of interesting things with it. We'll talk about how you use